Good morning. As we continue to gather this morning, we are going to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all our mind. And I want you to praise him with all of your strength this morning. Raise him up. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. All your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. I will serve you, Lord, with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. I will serve you, Lord, with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength. With all your heart. With all my mind, with all your strength, I will serve you, Lord, with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my are awake today. This is wonderful. Welcome to Epworth. We are delighted that you're worshiping with us today. And we welcome those watching through our DVD and what's the other thing I'm supposed to say? Online. Online, thank you. Ministries. Reverend Pat is on vacation. Can you tell? <sighs> I have a few announcements to share. The first one is I want to talk about the bulletins. We, we are... Um, We've downsized the bulletins for 915, and that is because this is contemporary worship, and contemporary worship often doesn't even have a bulletin. We've given you a little order of worship inside, and we've also made a change to the prayer ministry. We list um, the ones you see in the bulletin are the ones you're going to see every week. The large list that's just prayer concerns you share that aren't about friends or uh, members of our church family is listed outside right on the altar table right out where I'm pointing and so if you'd like a copy of that you're welcome to pick that up every week and pray for those people as well but we appreciate your patience with us as we make this change in our bulletin 
Our belongings class is being reworked. The belongings class is, the, um, is essentially our new members introduction. It's what we offer for people who are new to Epworth and would like to become a part of our church or are thinking about it. And our next class will be on Sunday, August 11th at 12.30 in Scott's Chapel, which is right over here. We really need you to RSVP if you want to come to this class because we're going to give you lunch. And we're also going to provide childcare if you need it. So if you'd like to come to that class, please let um, David Zooms. David, are you here? Talk about calling somebody out. Okay. Um, you can email David or you can stop in the church office or you can call the church office and leave your reservation. There's a belongings table. Oh, okay. There's a sign up sheet on the new members table. Thank you, Rose. Um, the other announcement is that there is no youth group tonight. Even though it says in the bulletin there is, that was a mistake. The last thing I want to talk about is the sermon series we're going to be doing in August. We're going to be doing Real to Real. It's a movie month, and I'm very excited about it. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at a different movie each week and talk about how it relates to our faith. The first movie is Lincoln on August 4th. How many of you have seen Lincoln? Okay, that's good. Now the rest of you, if you could try to see it between now and then, that would be great. You don't have to see it. I'm not going to keep you from coming in the doors. But it's going to make the experience more meaningful. And all of these movies are available on Redbox or uh, Netflix. Or you can go buy the DVD. So what I need help with is advertising. So those of you who own businesses, and I know there's some of you sitting here, Shannon owns a business, in, in Rehoboth, we'd love it if you could take a poster and put it in your window, or if you go to the library, or you know, a school, or whatever you think might work, the hospital. So um, where are my ushers? You got, if, you could, if you could put these on the back table and just help hand those out at the end. I don't ask too much of you guys, just hold mugs and thank you. Do we have any first-time visitors? And I know we do because I have a whole row of people that came from one of my, wait before you clap. My friends, from, my friends from Mount Zion United Methodist in Laurel, Maryland, we've been friends for a long time, but my most recent um, interaction with them was I was their guide, I was their coach for their church and their pastor. So if you all could just stand up and let us give a warm welcome to them. Thank you, thank you. So those are first-time visitors. What other first-time visitors do we have? Raise your hands. We're not going to make you stand up and talk. Just raise your hands. One over here? No, that's Reber. <laughs> You're pointing at somebody? Okay, okay. And up here? And over there. We have a gift for you. And now, please, share the peace and love of Christ with each other. serve a mighty God Yeah. 
lots of kids here today. I'm so excited to see all of you. I want to ask you, do you know who Mr. Rogers is? Oh, God, it went away. Do you know who Mr. Rogers is? You don't know who Mr. Rogers is? Okay, I'm going to show you a picture. Oh, this is really... Do you feel old now? <laughs> this is Mr. Rogers. He has a PBS TV show for children. Okay, Mr. Rogers Neighborhood, thank you, yes. It's a very old show, yes, okay. I get that. Well, he talks about a neighborhood, and he sings this song, and I'm really bad, so if you want to join me, choir, it, I would love the help. He sings, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Does that sound familiar? <laughs> well, anyway, the point is, Mr. Rogers talks about being a neighbor, and he has, he has his neighbors come and visit him. And you can let her go if she wants to go, sweetie. I love your dress. Oh, it is so pretty. And the shoes match? Yeah. And the hair thing? Oh. Anyway, yeah, you got her on the camera. It's just adorable. Anyway, he talks about being a neighbor. And so I want to ask you, do you have neighbors? Do you know what a neighbor is? Who can tell me what a neighbor is? A person that lives next to you, right? Or across the street or, you know, down the street. Do you all have neighbors? Do you know, how many of you know your neighbors? I don't know any of mine yet except for Carolyn who came and said hi. Okay, so, so sometimes neighbors do favors for us and we do favors, we do nice things for them because that's, being, that's what being neighborly is all about. So tell me, have you ever done something nice for your neighbors? Have you ever, like, walked the dog? You take care of their two cats? That's a perfect example. Anybody else do things for their neighbors? Oh, so your mom brought groceries when your neighbor was sick. That's, that's a good example. Has any, is it, have any of your neighbors helped you? Yeah? Baking delicious, Baking delicious dinners. That sounds wonderful. Well, you know, Jesus actually talks about being a neighbor in the Bible. He says, you shall love your neighbor. The greatest commandment is love God and love your neighbor as you love yourself. How much do you love yourselves? A lot, right? Hopefully, a lot. And so Jesus says we're to love our neighbors like we love ourselves. And so that's really uh, what I wanted to tell you about today. And I was thinking, are you going to meet new people this summer? Do you think you might meet some new people? Yeah, yeah. At the pool, at the beach, maybe at camp. And when, when school starts again in the fall, you're definitely going to meet new people because you know what? People move in the summer to new homes. Yeah, they do. And so you meet new people. And what would be a great neighborly thing to do to those new people that you meet? Say hi. Say hi. What else? Somebody new in the neighborhood. Do they, need, do they need new friends? Yeah. So maybe you could invite them to play with you or to ride bikes and explore the neighborhood together. All right, that's good. So that gives you something to think about this week, how to be a neighbor. And you could maybe check out PBS and Mr. Rogers. <laughs> Just for old time's sake, you know. Let's pray. Let's pray together, kids. Dear God, thank you for everything you do. Thank you for the neighbors you give us. And help us to be good neighbors, too. Amen. Thank you. As we stand, as the, the children go on to class today, um, we're going to be going into a moment of prayer. And you know, so many times we throw out those flash prayers, but God does call us, as, as Pastor Vicki shared last week, going 
coming along with Jesus and going to a quiet place where we can just be with him so that we can be more like him, so that we can see him in our lives and he can show us those neighbors that we need to be helping. So will you stand as we prepare our hearts for prayer this morning? Good morning. Uh, as y'all probably noticed, Susan and I are in the congregation instead of up here. Susan's had eye surgery recently and can't see the screen or the music or much of anything else, although she's getting a lot better. And my work schedule has kept me in D.C. much longer than I um, would want to be, so I'm missing our Thursday night practice, but hopefully in the fall I'll get to get back up here. 
But while I'm saying that, the purpose of that lead-in is I just want to thank Jim and the sound team and Julie and everybody. The sound is absolutely wonderful, and I'm so thankful. <laughs> I've been wanting to say that for a long time, so I've got it out of my system. Uh, so we're gonna do joys and concerns, and then we'll go out into the congregation. So we have concerns for Jeffrey Stewart, Sharon Warwick's cousin, who is starting his journey home, and for Jim Mounts, and for Ken Pyle. Prayers for Reverend Pat, as she is on vacation for two weeks, praise God. Continued healing for Nick Ferry, so I'll ask my uh, buddies to go out into the congregation and we'll have joys and concerns. The yellow mic. There you go. Good morning, I'd ask for prayers for Brian Campbell. I've spoken to you before about him. He had a liver transplant and he's just recently had triple bypass. So please pray for him. Hi folks, on behalf of Holly and I and our family, um, we just want to take a second and say thank you to the congregation and thank you to the church, pastoral staff, all the ministries, all the volunteers. Uh, we recently lost my mother last week and uh, we had a celebration of life with a reception back here at the church on Friday. And the outpouring of cards and gifts and thank yous and you know just everything that you guys have done spiritually uh, giving us our prayers, lifting us up, lifting our family, lifting my mother up. Uh, it means more than you guys will ever know. I just want to say thank you. God bless and love you. Today I'll be uh, reading the scripture, uh, of, uh, passage from Luke about the Good Samaritan. And I just, it's filled me with a lot of joy to, to know that I'll be reading that today. And uh, even though it's about someone that gets left robbed and, and left for dead on the side of the road, we all have concerns that uh, day to day we hope that a good Samaritan would come and help us with. And I pray that we can all do what the good Samaritan did in Luke and, and take the time to, to leave our own life and, and help others listen, be a friend, it doesn't have to be a major tragedy to, to be there for each other. Just reach out your hand and, and your heart and find the, the love inside to give to other people and, and everyone will give that love back and it'll be returned in full. Thank you. I just found out that I am going to be an aunt in December of a little girl whose name is going to be Lillian Skye, so just prayers for my sister Mandy that her pregnancy goes well. Um, I just wanted to reiterate about the Mr. Rogers thing and neighbors helping neighbors, and I wanted to thank all the volunteers who did come out and help in the West Rehoboth community as far as um, painting and, and helping us build our house. Thank you so much. Good morning. I want to thank everybody for all your prayers for my 19-year-old son who was diagnosed with melanoma. And um, he had surgery this past week. All of the nodes that they took out have come back clear, so we praise God for that. And he has an oncology appointment on Tuesday, and we feel very confident that they got it. He's going to be fine, and God has a really good plan for this young man. I want to put a PS onto that. Uh, that's the joy for the wild women of faith. We have been praying for Kyle, and we've also been praying for uh, Sharon and Paul Hemisphere, who were coming back from Mississippi and all those storms. They arrived safely. Uh, we know that Miriam is on her way and that we send loving arms around our Joyce pool. So uh, praise Lord. Kyle is on his way also, and thank you. 
I wanted to thank everybody. I noticed that you heard my words last week, and there's a lot of food out there in the baskets. The other thing is to my Epworth family. I am proud to say on the 27th of the month, I will marry the man that I love. After being with him almost 12 years, Now let's go to our Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, truly you are the good Samaritan, the divine neighbor who has stopped by the side of the road to soothe the wounds of our suffering and our human weakness. You call us to be neighbors to one another, especially to those most in need of our love and care. Today we join our prayers and our sacrifices with the compassionate work of all our Christian brothers and sisters around the world. May we all see ourselves as the loving eyes and heart and hands of Jesus. And may we seek to find in the persons we serve the eyes of Jesus returning our gaze. Teach us, O Lord, each day to search life's roadsides and ditches for the fallen, the weary, the wounded, the hungry, the less fortunate. May we not pass by on the other side, but like the Good Samaritan, stoop to help, to heal, to carry the person to an end of hope and grace. May this desire burn in the hearts of all who embrace the love and compassion of your Son, Jesus. To their hearts, we, in this moment and in this day, join our own. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And now join us as we sing the prayer that the Father taught us. Our Father, Our Father in heaven, in heaven, holy is your name. Holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Your Give us our sins as we forgive them who sin against us. Save us from the time. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. Today's lesson comes to us from the 10th chapter of Luke, verses 25 to 37, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, 
What must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him for dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. A woman was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. She was going along a deserted road and she fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped her of her clothes, they beat her, and they left her half dead lying in the road. After a time, a Samaritan came down the same road. Hey, what what happened? Hey, you're a Samaritan. You 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 funny faced weirdo. Don't get your hands off me. I, I was only trying to help. You were lying here unconscious, and, and yuck. Don't touch me. Oh, just don't touch me. Well, I, I mean, no, no, I was putting oil and wine on you. I mean, your, your, your wounds, yeah, well, I was trying drunk. to help them heal. You're drunk. Oh, no, these are all things from my medical bag. Why, I'm certified. Certified? <laughs> yeah, I bet. You know, I... I know all about you Samaritans. Drunk all the time, can't hold a job, you're probably homeless, and you look funny too. You know, if you don't get help with these injuries soon, you're going to be in serious trouble. Oh, just, just, you, you, you Samaritan, just, just leave me alone. (laughs) All right, if that's the way you want it. A priest was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and she too fell into the hands of robbers. Oh, they stripped her, stripped her of her clothes, they beat her, and then they went away, leaving her almost half dead. The Samaritan came down the same road. Necessary? Well, I was only trying to help. Your leg is broken, and and your ribs are probably broken too. This is serious. Yes. Well, it's 
Not that I'm uncomfortable with Samaritans. After all, some of my best friends are Samaritans. <laughs> and you, you can go on your way, though you are a credit to your race. Not like some of those lazy Samaritans always joking around, or those liberal Samaritans you hear so much about. Why, I'm sure you'll make something of yourself. Like a doctor, maybe. Well, let's not expect too much. Maybe a veterinarian. Don't worry about me. I'll be fine, just fine. Another woman, a Levite, was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when she too fell into the hands of robbers. Oh, they stripped her of her clothes, they beat her, and then went away, leaving her half dead. But the Samaritan, the Samaritan was going down the same road. I gotta find me another road. <laughs> And when he saw the Levite, the Samaritan took pity on her, and he went to the woman and he began to bandage her wounds. Please calm down, I'm only trying to bandage your wounds. Oh, probably trying to take my purse. You Samaritans are all alike, a bunch of deadbeats, criminals, thieves. Help, police, help, help! What seems to be the problem, ma'am? Wait, there's been some kind of mistake. I was only trying to help. Right, pal. I know you're kind. In fact, I'll bet, I'll bet you're the one that's been robbing all these travelers on the road. You're under arrest. Come with me. You have a right to remain silent. Throw the book at them. The only good Samaritan's a dead Samaritan. Which one of you, or which one of these women, do you think was a neighbor to the Samaritan? I couldn't think of one either. The best neighbors my family ever had lived across the street from us in Brunswick, Maryland. Sandy and Mary Sandretsky. Now Sandy was actually Tom, but he had been called Sandy his entire life. Brunswick loved nicknames. So they were the first ones I approached when we moved into the parsonage and I realized the small oven would not hold the Texas sheet cake pan. 
We had a serious crisis on our hands. You see, my children always have to have Texas sheet cake on their birthdays, and the oven was so tiny, I couldn't bake in it. So the deal with Mary Sandretsky was I would call her, she would set the oven to 350, and then I'd come over in a few minutes with the batter in the pan and slip it into her oven. They also loved our black lab hunter, spoiled him rotten, took care of him every time we were out of town. Sandy loved to garden, and he was forever telling me hints and tips that I could use with my flowers. They even picked up the kids from school in a pinch or dropped us off at the car repair shop. We tried to reciprocate by shoveling snow in the winter, and I made casseroles when they were sick and gave them homemade rolls. But I don't think we ever broke even. They were the best neighbors. It's funny, the word neighbor. Do you realize how long it's been around? I mean, since the Bible. I did a Bible gateway search, and one of the earliest uses in the Bible is in the passage in Exodus where the instructions are be being laid out for a monthly meal of lamb. <clears throat> if any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor. Like a good neighbor, we're asked to share. The Ten Commandments, the rules which Moses brought down off the mountain, included the word neighbor, only it's a different use this time. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, meaning you shall not want or desire your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's animals. And of course, most of us are familiar with the use of the word neighbor, which we find in today's gospel lesson. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Like a good neighbor. The word neighbor has been around forever, the concept, which makes it very interesting in today's gospel lesson that the lawyer asks the question, just who is my neighbor? Do we really think he doesn't know? Or is he just stalling for time? Because Jesus has asked him a very hard thing to do. So the story begins this way. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Did you hear that word? To test Jesus, saying, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, well, what does it say in the law? What do you read there? The lawyer then answers with the verse we just talked about, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, da -da 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 -da, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus replies, you have given the right answer. Now do this, and you will live. In other words, Jesus says, just a, don't tell me what the law says. I want you to actually practice it. I want you to live it, to model the law and the love for God and neighbor, and then when you do, then you'll inherit eternal life. That's what that means. And then the lawyer says, so who is my neighbor? Do we think he really doesn't know, or was he just stalling for time? I preached on the story of the Good Samaritan many times, and if you've been coming to church for a while, or if you read your Bible, you're probably familiar with it as well. If you're new to church, if you're new, if you're a new Christian, new to faith, you still may have heard of that phrase, Good Samaritan. And it comes from this scripture in the Bible. In all my years of preaching on this, I've never really unpacked this prelude to the story of the Good Samaritan until this week. This question from the lawyer and Jesus' response, which is all about our neighbor. The lawyer claims to not know who his neighbor is, and so Jesus spells it out by telling him the story of the Good Samaritan. Story of a man left for dead by the side of the road, and the people who choose not to help him, and the person who does help, the Good Samaritan. You saw a different version acted out, but it got the point home just as clearly. And you heard the gospel lesson. So I'm not going to retell the story. But what I do want us to look at this morning is what makes this story so shocking for the people who heard it the first time. 
In one of the commentaries I read this week, it said, when the people listening to Jesus tell this story of the Good Samaritan, and when the readers of the first scriptures heard this story, it was almost like us hearing those jokes that start, well, there was a priest and a doctor and a lawyer, and they walked into a bar. We kind of know what's going to happen, right? And so the people listening then were expecting the story to be, well, there was a priest and a Levite and an Israelite walking down the road. And they see a man dead by the side of the road. But that's not how the story went. That's not how Jesus told it. He said there was a priest and a Levite and a Samaritan. And the people listening are thinking, a Samaritan? That, that's not right. That's not how it goes. You've got the story wrong. You see, the lawyer's question and Jesus' response with the Good Samaritan story mean nothing unless we understand the relationship between Israelites and Samaritans in those days. And it was awful. They were enemies, deadlocked in a history of strife and hatred, Samaritans were descendants of a mixed race, and the Israelites were not into mixing the races. They were very much into their tribes, and you don't marry outside of your, of your nationality. So the Samaritans were descendants of a mixed race, and, and they, were, they had occupied the land of Israel following the conquest by Assyria, and so they were always an enemy of Israel. They opposed rebuilding the temple, and they worshipped somewhere else, and so they were viewed as the very opposite of the priest and Levite in this parable. They were considered unclean. That's why the actors didn't want to be touched. And they were social outcasts and religious heretics. So now hear this story again, and imagine the surprise of the lawyer. And all the people listening, when Jesus lifts up, the lawyer asks the question, who is my neighbor? And Jesus lifts up a Samaritan. He said, this tribe of people you don't trust, this person you have hated, they're the ones acting as a neighbor to the person lying in the ditch. And the people you usually look up to, the priest and the Levite, they're walking on by. Who's a good neighbor now? Of course, when we hear this story in 2013, we have to do some translating ourselves. To get the full impact, we have to ask ourselves, who would be our modern-day Samaritans? Who are the people we don't trust? Who are the enemies of our country? Would it be the terrorists? Radical Muslims? Dictators from other countries? The shock of this story to those who heard it the first time and to us as well is that Jesus wipes away our stereotypes. That's what this story is about. It's about us stereotyping people. Jesus wipes away our stereotypes of good neighbors and good Christians and good people and says essentially, it's not what you say. It's what you do. It's not even who you are. It's how you respond in love, like a good neighbor. You see that the priest and the Levite were, were tops in their community. They were pillars of strength and wisdom. But it's the rejected one, the enemy, the mixed race guy walking through the neighborhood, He's the one who stopped and cared for the man by the side of the road. In this story, Jesus challenges all of our tendencies to categorize people, to put people into boxes, to set up boundaries, boundaries of race, religion, region, class, social position, it all means nothing, Jesus says. Your stereotypes mean nothing, he says. Your categories mean nothing. 
And so at the end of the story, Jesus turns to the lawyer and asks, which of these three was a neighbor to the man in the ditch? And you know how when you have to give an answer and you just don't even want to say it out loud, the, the lawyer probably looks at his feet and he goes, the one who showed mercy. The one who acted out of compassion. The one who didn't let the walls divide. That's a good neighbor. There's an Arab proverb which says, to have a good neighbor, you must be one. Have you ever had the kind of experience like the lawyer did that day? where you pretty much figured out what the deal was, who the hero is, and how a story should turn out, or what the moral really is, and then the exact opposite happened. You ever had that happen to you? I had it happen to me one time. I was in my first career, we're talking a long time ago, managing a fabric store in downtown DC near DuPont Circle, 18th and M, House of Fine Fabrics. There were lots of homeless people in the city. I watched a woman become a homeless. I saw her the first day she arrived on the streets, surrounded by her new clean suitcases and her, and her new winter coat, and I watched her over the next few months just lose everything, including her mind. But I want to tell you about a Native American man who came into my store from time to time. He would come in and he would buy beads and embroidery floss and big lengths of wool, and he would make these wonderful capes that he wore to keep warm in the winter. And he was homeless. He lived on the streets of D.C., and he was dirty, and, and he was ill-kempt, and I had pretty much put him into a box in my mind of those who are not to be trusted. So one day he showed up with a whole lot of traveler's checks, and he wanted to buy a lot of stuff. And he had me cut all this fabric for me. And we had a big stack of fabric, and he handed me these traveler's checks, and I was suspicious. Where did he get them? How could he get them? He doesn't have a job. So I went in the back, and I called the bank that the traveler's checks were issued from. And they asked me some questions, and I said, yeah, they got a signature on him, and he has a, an old driver's license. It's expired, but it's him. And they matched, and they said, ma'am, you have to take those checks. I said, okay. So I went back out, and I took his checks, and I rang up his sale, and I gave him his change, and I was starting to bag the items, and he stopped me. And he said, my mother always taught me to tell the truth. And I need to tell you, you just gave me back too much change. And with that, I realized I thought he'd given me $200 in traveler's checks, and he'd actually given me $150, and with that he handed me back $50. $50 that I'm sure he could have used, but he chose instead to be honest about it. Like the lawyer, I had categorized and demonized and figured out who was the good person in the room, and boy, was I wrong. God humbled me that day, and that was 30 years ago, and I still remember it like it was yesterday. What it felt like to learn from that man what a good neighbor looked like. Do you have a story like that in your life? A time when you went looking for something, or maybe you needed help from somebody, and the answer came in a most blessed and unusual way. Almost as if God was teaching you a lesson about how to be a good neighbor. I bet some of you have stories like that. The truth is, friends, as long as the Bible has been around, God has been asking us and showing us how to be neighbors how to love others, how to respond with God's love even in those situations when we would rather not, how to set aside our stereotypes and our categories for people and simply accept and welcome them and love them like a good neighbor does. And even though it sounds like the most simplest of things, 
to love our neighbor? In fact, it's not easy at all. And that's why the lawyer asked the question in the first place, because it's not easy. Just who is my neighbor? Please don't tell me it's that guy next door with the loud cars and the crazy music. Please don't tell me it's the woman in the office next to mine with her bigoted stories and her funny looks. Please don't tell me, God, that my neighbor is the person who makes my life miserable. And then Jesus tells us the story of the Good Samaritan and says, go and do likewise. Build bridges instead of boundaries, he says. Make peace instead of fighting. Bake a pie and make a friend, he says. Let go of the stereotypes we carry around and instead share the love of God. Like a good neighbor. I went to bed last night at 9.30 and the verdict came in on the George Zimmerman case at 10 p.m. I kept thinking of Trayvon Martin as I prepared for this sermon and as I wrote this sermon. Because you can't help but make a comparison between the guy who's in the wrong neighborhood at the wrong time and the Good Samaritan. I don't know what the answer is, friends. But we have an opportunity this week to be good neighbors to everyone we meet. That's our call as Christians. That's what Jesus asks of us. Amen. We have choices to make every time we're around somebody, every time we pass by somebody in the grocery store or on the sidewalk. We see people hurting. And how many times do you ask yourself, the last time I was hurting, did someone help me? And there's a song that um, the youth sang a couple years ago when they did the random acts of kindness. I refuse, and I want you to listen to these words. Sometimes I, I just want to close my eyes and act like everyone.
I refuse to turn my back and try and act like all is well. I refuse to stay unchanged and wait another day to die to myself. I refuse to make one more excuse. Cause I don't want to live like I don't care. Pray that you refuse and make the move. And I'm not sure that you realize that that lovely young woman singing with Julie is her daughter. That is Faith. Her name is Faith. I invite you now to take the blue connection pads that you find at the end of the pew, hopefully, and sign in and pass those down. We have lots of visitors today, so for the visitors, your instructions are to please put your name and phone number and address and email and uh, social security number, driver's license number, <laughs> whatever way we can get in touch with you. We're really glad everybody's here today. And the connection pads are a great way to see who's new on your aisle and say hi. Epworth is known as being a very friendly church. And this summer it's especially important because we have so many visitors that we welcome them and greet them warmly. Be a good neighbor, right? As we prepare to bring our offering this morning, we have a lot to think about this week. We have a lot to pray about this week, and, and, and our prayers are something that we actually can give to God, to the church, to our Rehoboth community. I'll tell you one thing I worry about is all the pedestrians and all the bicyclists, and another person died this week. Almost every week we've had someone die in Rehoboth or Dewey because of a traffic accident and a pedestrian. And so we bring our prayers, they're part of our offering to God. We pray for our community, we pray for those on our prayer list. We pray for things that we can't even say out loud to anybody else. And it's all a part of our gift to God. And so would you join me now in a, in a time of prayer? Gracious God, we thank you for the gifts you give us. We thank you for our faith, which we lean on in times of uncertainty, which we cling to when things happen which we don't understand. We thank you for the opportunity to be good neighbors in our communities and in our church and in our, at our workplace and on the beach at the pool, in the grocery store, on the, on the road. Help us to be the people you call us to be, oh God. We thank you for the gifts that you place in our lives, for family and friends, for jobs, for homes, for cars, for vacations, for the things we have, all the blessings you've given us. And be with us now as we return a portion, our portion, our sacrifice, our tithe. We bless that you, we, we ask you to bless it, Lord. And use it, and use it to fulfill your will for this church and this town and our world. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. One, two, three.
Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. Go in peace, my friends. Your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us up.
you use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in the song of your salvation. And love your people sing Remember your children, remember your promise.